Good morning. The guys have got outlines here to pass out. Don't be afraid when you see how long the outline is, really. It is a long one, but Pastor Andrew wanted to make sure that we had a chance to do a little bit of review. And I want to just say that there is a reason why I've put so much detail in the outline today. One is that we've got a short little passage we're doing, but it's a passage that is just jam-packed with good stuff. So there's a lot of really great content in there. So didn't want to miss it. Um, in fact, when Pastor Andrew comes back, he may have some things that he'll even want to add. He may even have some things that he might want to give a little different view on or a little different nuance or maybe even correct if I don't get it all right. That's okay. But I also wanted to make sure that we really took time this morning with this passage because I think this is a neglected topic. We're going to be talking about some specific aspects of the strategic role of women in the life of the church. And I'm not sure that in most churches we talk about that enough. And the other reason that I wanted to make sure to really spend time in detail is that I think this is incredibly, incredibly important. I think that when you have a church where the family is working the way that it's supposed to, the church family is working the way it's supposed to, when you have a church where the women are pouring into each other's lives and are doing well and are healthy, I think that dramatically affects the life of the church. So I think what we're talking about is super, super important this morning. Father, I ask that you give us wisdom as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Now, as we get going, let me just say that I think it's probably worth reminding us that there are a few reasons why we all need to tune into the subject. Now, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about some things that we're drawing from the book of Titus. And in Titus, remember that the book starts out, Titus was given a, a critical responsibility. He was supposed to go to the island of Crete. He's going to straighten out messed up churches. The churches had problematic leaders, they had problematic doctrine, they had problematic behavior. In Titus 1, 5 to 16, Titus is told to go and to appoint godly elders and to oppose false teachers and their false teaching. He's got a big job to do. But when he gets done giving these instructions to Titus, in chapter 2, the focus is going to shift from the leaders and what kind of leaders we need to have and what their responsibilities are to the congregation itself. And Paul is going to have some specific instruction for the different groups in the church. And we heard Pastor Andrew a couple of weeks ago talk about the, the older men there to be sober-minded, that is, their discipline of life brings a clarity of mind. They're to be dignified. They're to be honorable and respectable with clear godly values. They're to be self-controlled. That is, their inside values should control their outside behavior. They're to be sound in faith and in love and in steadfastness. They're to be spiritually healthy and stable. In other words, if the men are doing well, they should be diametrically opposed to virtually everything that society tells us we should expect from men. Is the model of the men that get the respect and the attention and the acclaim that they're sober-minded, clear-thinking people? Is dignified behavior really our cultural standard for fame and approval? Is self-control really what we expect from the beautiful people, the famous people, the ones that are at the top of the pyramid? Are we expecting them to be sound in faith and love and steadfastness? No. So Paul is telling Titus, look, in our congregation, we have got these different groups of people. We've got older men and older women, younger men, younger women. And in the household of God, the way that we should look and the way that we should live should be very, very different than what society does. Not so different that it's strange just for the sake of strangeness. There should be a familiar, familiarity to it. But we should be living out a set of values that are very, very different from the values of the culture around us. The result then is that older men in the body of Christ are to be a model of what it means to faithfully walk in God's grace with God's people in a fallen world. That's the goal. 
Now we move to the second quadrant, though. We're talking about older men, and now we're going to talk about older women, and, and in a moment after that, we're going to talk about younger women. So maybe this is something that everybody else can just tune out. Maybe the first part, the only people that need to listen is the older women. Well, I've got a few reasons why I want to suggest that this, this passage matters to all of us. First is this is Scripture, and all Scripture is designed to equip all Christians. So, all scripture is, any of my students memorize this one? All scripture is, hmm? All right, all scripture, it's breathed out by God, it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness that the man and woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, this is for all of us. Second, Men don't say, oh, this is for the older women, so that doesn't count for me because a lot of what Paul says here has to do with character. And anything that has to do with character applies to everyone. So guys, you might be looking forward to taking a little nap, but we're not off the hook. Or maybe you're saying, well, if it's older women, then that doesn't include me because I'm not older. But keep in mind, no matter how young you are, you're still older than somebody else. Age is relative. So keep in mind, at whatever point you are in your walk, you're a little bit ahead of somebody else. And age is not always going to be chronological either. We can talk about maturity. So be prepared to listen up because God wants us all to make ourselves useful. And the final thing is, this passage is about family business and family business is everybody's business. So Paul opens. Here's what he says. He says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what's good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Those first few words, older women likewise. Older women. Well, what does that mean? There is not a precise age requirement. This is a relative expression, but Paul is definitely thinking about people that have got some maturity and some life experience that they could pass on. Again, whatever you've already learned, you can pass on to somebody else. Whatever situation you've already been through, you can understand when somebody else goes through it. And maybe the things that you've already learned the hard way, you have the opportunity to pass on to somebody else so they don't have to learn them the hard way. The next little word also matters. It's older women likewise. And it's kind of a funny word because we've just been talking about older women and Paul is gonna say, okay, now I'm, we've been talking about older men, now I've got something to say to the older women. And you see that word likewise and the funny thing about it is that he's about to give a somewhat different set of instructions. The thing is though that what he's about to say to the older women is really just unpacking a similar set of things to what he's saying to the older men. Now, parents, you know that loving your children equally does not mean treating them the same. Not always. Because they've got different personalities, they've got different maturity levels, they've got different abilities, they've got different roles in the family. And it wouldn't be appropriate to treat every one of your children in exactly the same way because they're different doesn't mean that you love one or another any more or any less, but you've got to love them in keeping with who they are. And in the body of Christ, in the family of God, the same thing is true. We, we are all called to demonstrate godly character, godly behavior, but each of us has a unique role. And so we're gonna have some different ways that that's gonna get fleshed out in our lives. So older women, likewise, like the men, are to have a particular role. So what is that role? Well. Older women, first of all, says likewise to be reverent in their behavior. And reverent 
really isn't a word that we use very often anymore. We'd be more likely to hear irreverent, talk about irreverent rumor, humor, uh, a joke that doesn't take serious things seriously. But this word here, um, this, is a, this is a word that, that's made up of two different things. One is a Greek word that has to do with holiness, and it's a word that would be applied to temples and things like that, holy places. And the other part of it is a word that means seemly or fitting or appropriate. So the idea here is that the older women are to be engaged in holy living, that they should have behavior that's appropriate to somebody who is set apart as God's servant. But this isn't just attached to holy places. In fact, this is the kind of holiness that God calls us to is a whole life holiness. So he's saying that the older women, they they shouldn't be wild, they shouldn't be indiscreet, they shouldn't be provocative, they, they shouldn't be all the things that the world maybe says is the ideal. Think of it this way. If we're gonna be reverent, we're gonna be living out our identity as being the holy ones of God, a part of what that means is that in our appearance, in our speech, and in our behavior, there shouldn't be anything that would make it awkward in, this, in the next second to share the gospel with somebody. If I have just been speaking or behaving in a way that now I'm gonna talk about Jesus and it's just weird, then probably there's something that I shouldn't have been saying or doing in the first place. Everything about our behavior, everything about the way that we're living our lives should set the stage for being able to share a gospel of a God who is holy and has taken broken people who are estranged from him and through the sacrifice of Christ drawn us to him that we might have transformed lives. So he's saying, older women, live your daily lives in ways that fit that message. Be one person. Don't have who you are at church and who you are everywhere else. Be one person who's living in a way that fits with the gospel. And he adds, he says, older women likewise are to be not slanderers. Now this one's a little shocking because the word that he's gonna use is the Greek word that usually is used in the Bible for the devil. Not expecting to hear that. More generally, the word can just mean accuser. You may remember Revelation 12, 10, there's a voice that will cry out from heaven and, and will proclaim now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them night and day before our God. That's one of the titles of the devil, one of the titles of Satan, that he is the accuser of the brethren. He loves to point out everything that's wrong. He accuses us of sin and goes beyond conviction. He wants to convince us that we're worthless and valueless. Well, ladies, Paul is saying, pay special attention don't be slanderers. So what does that mean? Part of what it means is that, goss- that gossip and mean-spirited criticism are not compatible with reverence or holiness. Or more to the point, complaining and criticism are not spiritual gifts. There is no spiritual gift of pointing out how messed up the other guy is. It doesn't fit with our calling. It doesn't fit with this gospel message. But Paul's not done. He says, Titus, and notice this is Paul from a distance saying, Titus, now make sure that you tell the ladies this. It's kind of like Pastor Andrew saying, now, Mike, I have left the state, but I want you to make sure to tell the ladies. So eh, some, some shrewdness there, I think. But Paul is telling Titus, I also want you to remind them not to be slaves to much wine. And this one is kind of not what we're expecting. We kind of are going to say, hey, just, you know, just avoid this stuff. But he's saying, remind them not to be slaves to much wine. Now, if, if I were to say, um, let's see, what do we have here? Alex. If I were to say, Alex, get off the stage. 
What would be strange about that for me to be telling Alex right now to get off the stage? He's not on the stage. I don't need to be telling Alex to get off the stage because he's not there. So if Paul is giving this instruction and saying, remind the ladies not to be slaves to what to much wine, there's a pretty good chance that some of the ladies are what? Slaves to much wine. So he's going to address things that he has, is seeing as issues in the congregation. So what's going on here? Well, these are faithful disciples of Christ. They should be. You're older women. The idea is that faithful disciples of Christ should refuse to give themselves over to the power of something that will numb them to life and numb them to God and his, his purposes for them. Romans 6.19 says, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Paul says, don't have any master but Jesus. So he said, Titus, tell them, don't do this and don't do this, but Titus, here's where I'm headed with this. The older women, they are to teach what is good. It's not just how they're to behave, but there's also a function that they're to serve, and he says they're to teach what is good. And Paul, it's kind of fun. Paul is a guy, he actually likes to make up words. As you're going through the New Testament, there are points where Paul will use a particular word, and no place else in all of ancient Greek literature does anybody at all ever anywhere use that word except the Apostle Paul. So it, it appears that that's just kind of one of the things he likes to do. He's like, yeah, I just want to say this thing, and there's not a word for it, so I'll just make one up. And so he'll do these mashups of two different words and just kind of slam them together. And it looks like this is one of them, and he took a word for good and a word for teaching, and he smashed them together, and what he's saying here is that the older women are to be good teaching people. She's a good teaching woman. She's a good teaching person. That's, that's supposed to be her nature. The kind of people you spend time with and you end up getting good ideas and good habits, you know the other kind, right? At some, some point in the course of your life, haven't you hung out with somebody and when you hang around with them, you end up with bad ideas and you pick up bad habits? This is the opposite. This is the person that you hang out with them and you just can't help but be influenced for good. He says, older women, that's what I want you to be. Now, got a couple of words of warning here. One is, this does not mean that we should just feel free to stick our noses into the lives of everyone younger than we are. Nobody likes a busybody. I've got a reference there, 1 Timothy, Timothy 5, 15. That actually should be 1 Timothy 5, 13. But Timothy is over working in, uh, in Ephesus while Titus is working in Crete. And he finds that over there, one of the difficulties in the Ephesian church is that some of the younger women, it says they're going about from house to house and not only idlers but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not say. So again, it seems as though Paul is addressing an issue that's a problem, that, that there are some of the women that, that they're just kind of out and about wandering around and stirring up trouble and stirring up gossip. And Paul says, no, that's... That's not what we want, and older ladies don't be that either. Now, second word of caution, being a teaching what is good person also does not mean nonstop talking. One of the most important things that we can teach by example is how to listen. James 3, pretty much the whole book of Proverbs, talk a whole lot about the wisdom of knowing when to be quiet. And you know when we should be quiet? Most of the time. So as this is encouraging the older women to teach the younger women, this is not saying stick your nose in their business, everything that they're doing. We've all had the experience of at some point in life where, where we find somebody sort of unpleasantly pushing their way in and, and weighing in on every part about our life and we're saying, you know, wait a second, I don't, I don't even know you. Our relationship isn't there. You don't know me. 
So we don't want that. And this is also not somebody that every moment you sit down with them, they are talking your ear off. Older women, a part of what you're going to need to teach and model is listening to be able to know where the younger ladies are at and the kinds of things that they're struggling with and that applies not just to older women but to us all. When I was in high school, we had a volunteer who was working with our youth group and he ended up spending some time one-on-one with me doing Bible study and and mentoring and discipling me. And there's a point where he he said, and I think it was five weeks, but it might have been longer. He said, said, Mike, I want you to take the next X amount of time and I want you to read the book of James. Okay, the book of James. Five chapters, not a long one. Okay, and read the book of James? Yeah. For five weeks? Yeah. And I want you to read it, and reread it, and reread it, and reread it, and think about it, and ask God what he wants to teach you, and I would like to, I'd like to challenge you to spend this next season of time in the book of James. After the fact, I realized one of the reasons that he wanted me to spend time in the book of James was to learn to keep my mouth shut. Because skill number one for a teacher is not public speaking. Skill number one for a teacher is listening and knowing when to be quiet. He knew that I had a character issue I needed to deal with and he sent me to James as the antidote. Maybe some of you uh, could use the same medicine that was helpful to me. I I, uh, heartily recommend the book of James. Finally, in teaching what's good, One of the things this does mean is that like the older men, the older women in the body of Christ are to model and teach what it means to faithfully walk in God's grace with God's people in a fallen world. We're teaching not just by our words, but by our example. The idea is letting people in our lives enough that they can see us walk with Christ in the midst of life's difficulties. And Paul says, Titus, They're to teach what's good and so train the young women. Now, this is a funny word, this word train. This is a word that's actually built from the word wisdom. If there were such a word as wiseify, that would be pretty much the idea. We don't have an English word wiseify. We probably should. He's saying older women wiseify the young women. That means pass on your wisdom. Help the younger women know how to live wisely and well. But don't miss the little word, so. Because he says, so train the young women. Helping younger folks grow in wisdom requires demonstrating wisdom, and unfortunately, age doesn't guarantee wisdom. All right, plug your ears, younger folks. Those of us of a certain age, you've heard the saying, there's no fool like an old fool. That can be us. So our, our responsibility is to walk in wisdom, to not just say, hey, I'm, I'm older, I'm honorable, I've been through things, I've got something to offer. It's part of our responsibility to actually walk in wisdom so we have something to offer. So we are to be a certain kind of people in order that we might be good teaching people and so train or so wiseify the younger ones. At any age, old, young, or in between, it's the people who never stop pursuing wisdom and maturity who have the most to offer. However old you are, however young you are, if you are nonstop, relentlessly, won't let it drop, won't ever sit back, won't ever say enough is enough, you are pursuing wisdom and maturity. This is the, this is the 90-year-old who's saying, when I grow up, I want to be wiser. This is the 90-year-old that's saying, I'm, I'm reading this book or going to this conference or learning this thing. We never get to the point where we're ready to stop learning. And if we do, we need to stop teaching, that's for sure. Now, notice too, 
the wisdom of God in the structure. That God is giving to the older women a particular responsibility to teach the younger women. And we look at that and we just go, you know what, that is just a common sense, wise kind of plan. And that's so on a number of levels. One thing is, there are a lot of things that men just simply cannot, cannot understand fully about a woman's life experience. Can a man understand what it's like to carry a little one inside for nine months? No. We can listen. We can try to pay attention. We can try to get it, but we don't get it. There's a whole lot of things about a woman's life experience that a man simply cannot get, and because we haven't lived it and don't really get it, we're not equipped to help. But on a more basic level than that, I want you to just imagine this. Imagine that you had a young man who, who uh, ended up coming forward and saying, you know what, I think God is calling me into ministry. You're like, wow, that's fantastic. That's, that is great news. Yeah, yeah, he's calling me into ministry. Well, well, do you have an idea what kind of ministry God's calling you into? Yeah, I think God is calling me to dedicate my life to ministering to all of the single women. <laughs> Would you have some concerns? Yeah. So we look at that and we go, okay, just even on a pragmatic level, in terms of wisdom and what's going to keep things healthy, it makes sense that if anybody is going to take particular interest and particular responsibility in seeing to it that the younger women are growing and getting sounding boards and examples and people that can help them to come along in maturity, in God's wisdom, he has said, older women, you need to take special responsibility for that. And all the more because, as, as silly as my example is, one of the hallmarks of a false teacher, whether it's a male or a female, one of the hallmarks of false teachers is they tend to get inordinately involved with members of the opposite sex. They tend to prey on members of the opposite sex. And so in God's wisdom here, he has set up a structure in, among the family of God to keep things healthy and productive and useful because, sorry ladies, there are just some things that I can't really understand and I can't directly help you with, but maybe Lily can. Now, the older women are supposed to train the younger women. They're supposed to wiseify them. What are they supposed to wiseify them to do? Well, they're supposed to train them to love their husbands and children. Now, Paul here is going to use another word that's kind of a mashup word and and it's going to emphasize more what they're to be than, than what they're to do. And he actually is going to, use, he's going to use the word husband loving. So he's going to say, the young women, they should be husband loving. So they should be, they should be women that, that have warmth and affection for their husband. That should be, that should be their character. You, you shouldn't wonder, does she really love her husband? It should, you should see it. And, and he says that they should be kid loving saying that, that they should have a love for their children. They should be characterized by care and fondness for their families. Now, I suspect that we don't, don't name any names and don't look at anybody, but I suspect that we have all encountered at some point somebody whose mission in life seems to be to make sure everybody knows how horrible their spouse and children are. You've met that person, right? The guy who can't wait to tell you all of his wife's flaws and how horrible she is. The wife who's doing the same about her husband. The parents who's saying, oh yeah, you might think my kid's a good kid, but let me tell you how awful he is. Let me tell you how horrible she is. And you just go, uh, you know, I, I, I thought your husband was a good guy. I thought your wife was, was a nice gal. I kind of liked your kid, but now that I'm hearing you talk about him, I'm thinking I don't want to have anything to do with him. Paul says, teach the young women that even though culturally that's cool, you get together and you crack on your husband, you get together and you crack on your wife, you get together and you crack on your kids. Paul says, no, that's not what they need to know. They need to be people that have warmth and fondness and affection for their husbands, for their kids. Um, I will say, for, for some of those of you, um, this, some of those of you that don't have kids 
And, and as we're talking about these things, these are family things. We have people in the congregation that are in different kinds of family situations. For, for the woman who's longing to have kids and can't, this is a hard thing to listen to right now. And you need to understand that what Paul is talking about, he's talking about the way that the family of God is structured. He's gonna talk about family life. And don't for a minute come away thinking that there's something second class about being married and not having kids in the picture. And for some of you that aren't married, you're thinking, well, this is all really nice, but this sort of leaves me out. Well, I want to say that that is not the case. I want to say that being married and having kids is not the only way to glorify God. We'll return to this idea in just a little bit. But Paul is saying, for those that are wives and moms, you should have your heart set to being fond, to having love, to having affection for your husband and your kids. And that should just flow. It should be obvious. Now, Lily, I remember, um, I remember you expressing before, before kids came into the picture for us, um, Lily expressed the concern. She said, you know, I've, I'm not the person that always just sat around longing to be married and longing to be a mom. I can't even relate to that. She had other dreams. She had other things that she wanted to pursue, other things that she was interested in. And so I can remember, even as we're expecting our first, that she's like, I, I'm kind of concerned because I don't know if I'm going to have that mother love that everybody seems to talk about. But I assure you, when that little one arrived on the scene. God saw to it that there was plenty of mother love there that somehow comes with the package. So this is something, if you're sitting there and you're going, this is not what I aspire to, I've got other things in life, well, God will see to it and equip you with things that you need when the time comes. So don't worry about that one either. We'll come back in a moment to, to a couple of these things. Paul's gonna add in, he's gonna say, Beyond what we're talking about here in family, he says, train or wiseify the young women to be self-controlled. Now, that should be a, a familiar word because we've already run into that one. In Titus 1.8, 1 Timothy 3.2, that's one of the qualifications for elders. And just back in verse 2, that's one of the things that Paul said the older men should be. They should be self-controlled. Pastor Andrew put, he explained it that the idea is their inside values control their outside behavior. So this is a every age, every situation of life, we are called to be self-controlled. And Paul adds in, he says, Titus, make sure that the older women, and again, this is not Titus' job to go and get the younger women. He's saying, remind the older women to train the younger women to be pure. What does that mean? Well, this, this does include sexual purity. But there's a whole lot more than that. 1 Timothy 5.22, when he is appointing elders, Paul says, don't be hasty in laying on of hands or take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So, so be careful. Don't end up letting yourself get pulled into something. Hebrews 5.14, the author says, solid food is for the mature who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to dis distinguish good from evil. Part of what's going on here is that older women are to help the younger women to grow in discernment so they won't get mixed up in things, even may, things that may seem innocent, but might really actually be harmful to their spiritual health. Bottom line, it is the job of older women to give the gift of perspective. You don't know what you don't know. Older women, Give the gift of perspective. The experiences that you've had where you realize that something wasn't quite what you thought it was. When you charged ahead into a situation and you ended up finding that the consequences were far more serious than you ever imagined. 
That time when you didn't listen to counsel and now if you could do it over again, you would. Share those stories with the younger women. Pass those things on. Give them the gift of perspective to see things that maybe they can't quite see just yet. Then Paul adds, train them to be working at home. Now, we looked at this, this passage here, 1 Timothy 5.13, not 15, 5.13. Um, we saw there's this problem in Ephesus where it seems as though some of the younger, younger women are going around and involved in things they shouldn't. So it may be that there's a similar thing going on in Crete to what's going on in Ephesus. But I do want to stop and just note when, when he says, Titus, make sure the older women train the younger women to be working at home, this does not rule out women working outside the home. So if you hear this and you're saying, oh, that's it, it says working at home, what Paul is saying is that the, the little woman's role is to be at home and she can't be out and about and she can't have a job and she can't have a career and she can't. No, that's not in this passage. Actually, if you've read um, Proverbs 31, the, this picture of the ideal woman, Here's a woman who's carrying out business transactions and buying real estate and doing all kinds of things. We don't have that kind of picture at all. This is not forbidding activity outside the home. But what it does point out is that having a healthy home and family life takes intentional hard work. It just does. I have yet to talk with somebody who's down the road ahead of me in the seasons of life and hear them say, you know, I really wish that I had spent less time with my kids and more time with my career. Never happened. Never heard it. It takes hard work for your family to be healthy, but even more than that, the regrets that we're most likely to have regarding our own family is the effort that we didn't put in, the time that we didn't spend. So Paul is saying, help, sure the, help the older women make sure the younger women know to put in the hard work that it takes to do everything they can to have a healthy home and family life. But as you may have noticed, sometimes really hard work has a tendency to make us a little cranky. Doesn't it? I've worn my fingers to the bone. I've done all these things. Actually, it's a struggle, true confession. When I'm working on a sermon and I'm spending time trying to focus on something and the phone is ringing and the doorbell's going and there's things going on, I've got to stop and remind myself, I'm handling the word of God. I can't be, I can't be, frustrated and upset and tense and have my family walking on eggshells because I'm studying the word of God. That's not okay. Sometimes hard work brings out that side of us and so Paul says, Titus, have the older women wiseify the younger women, train them to be kind. The word here can mean kind, it can mean good, it can mean pleasant. And Paul is not saying the women should be weak. Absolutely not. What he is asking is he's saying, remind the younger women not to be harsh. I think about my mother-in-law, and when you, when you talk about in-laws, that's one of those things where a lot of times the subject of in-laws come, come up and people start getting those expressions and crossing their arms, and you, know, you can just see that there's a story to tell. I need to tell you, I hit the jackpot with in-laws. I miss my mother-in-law. She went to be with the Lord a number of years ago. Um, she was a strong, strong woman. I've, I've often described her as a force of nature. She was that kind of person with she had a personality bigger than the room and just had enthusiasm and energy and force of character that dragged everybody along with her. And if she was enthusiastic, somehow everybody else was enthusiastic. She's that kind of person, powerful, strong. But oh, did she encourage me. I knew that she loved me. And she encouraged me and lifted me up and affirmed me. 
Not that she was weak, she was anything but. But she was kind to me. And that makes me want to be a better man. And the same is true for my wife. You're going to notice over the course of time, my students already know it, we've talked about it a little bit in class. You're not going to hear me tell stories on my wife. You're not going to hear me tell a story where I'm going to make Lily look bad. Not going to happen. <laughs> if it does, you call me out on it because I need to confess and repent and get some things straight. It's not my job to make the people in my family look bad. I'm not going to tell stories about Mark that are going to make Mark look bad. I want to affirm them. I want to respect them. I want to lift them up. I, I want to attribute dignity to them. I'm not going to tear them down. Of course not. Nothing kind about that. There's nothing helpful about that. And I'd be willing to bet so that those of you who have spent time with Lily haven't heard her do that to me or to Mark either. It's just something that as a family, we, that's not what we're about. That's not what we want to do. We want to be kind to one another in the way that we treat each other and even in the way that we talk about one another on the outside. It's not our job to tear down. It's not that we're to be weak, but we're not to be harsh. We're not to be destructive. We're not to be damaging, not to be discouraging. And now we get to the part that I think sent Andrew running out of town and leaving me with this passage. Paul says to Titus, remind the older women to train the younger women to be submissive to their own husbands. Now, there are a whole lot of passages that I could have pulled out here. I, I pulled out four. Um, the Bible, it talks about, and uses exactly the same word. It talks about Jesus being in submission to his earthly parents. It talks about Jesus, God the Son, being in submission to God the Father. Is that a relationship of inferiority? Jesus was submitting to his earthly parents because they were superior to him. No. He's the one through whom the universe was spoken into existence. He is so far their superior that we can't even wrap our minds around it. And yet, in that role as their child, it was appropriate that he submit to the leadership of his parents. And God the Son doesn't submit to God the Father because God the Father is better. It's because that's a role that in God's wisdom, in God's decree, characterizes how they relate to one another. Not superiority and inferiority. Notice the same word submission is also used in the way that we relate to human authorities. And it's used even for one another. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. We're actually supposed to have that kind of mindset. So, this has absolutely, positively nothing whatsoever to do with superiority and inferiority. We see that from the example of Christ, and we also see that from the fact that back in Genesis, and my students could probably come up with this one too, God created them male and female, and that male and female, how did he create them? In God's image, Male and female created in God's image, both reflecting the image of God. Not superiority, not inferiority. This is talking about the reality that members of a family, like members of any group whatsoever, have got different roles. It's also important that we notice that this is not talking about every single male-female interaction that ever happens. This is specific to marriage relationships, specific to family living. Um, I teach at Sheridan Hills Christian School. My boss is Christy Chipman. Mrs. Chipman is the principal of Sheridan Hills Christian School. I report to her. She comes in my classroom and she evaluates me as a teacher. It's not the other way around. She's my boss. And you know what? I am happy about that. Because she is a whole lot better principal than I could ever be. 
She has a set of skills and abilities. She, she has character qualities that I don't have. I admire, I appreciate, I am grateful that I work for Christy Chipman. This passage is not saying that every woman has got to just immediately bow and scrape before every man. That's not what's going on here. This is talking about something specific to the marriage relationship. This also does not mean that husbands get to lord it over their wives. Jesus makes it absolutely crystal clear. He says the the Gentiles love to lord it over each other, but among you, the one who wants to be great shall be a servant. The one who wants to be first in the kingdom shall be slave, slave of all. And over in Ephesians 5, we see this idea that women are to be submitted to their husbands, but it also talks about husbands loving their wives and loving their wives like Christ loved the church. We're talking about a tremendous sacrificial love, a willingness to serve. So what this does assume is it assumes that love and humility and service characterize Christian relationships. What does this look like in a marriage? One of the things is, as Pastor Andrew and I were talking about this morning, he said, you know what you might want to do? You might want to go ahead and, and have Lily come on up and join you. And I know, I know she's got some things to share. And, and it might be that you'd want to bring her on up and have her give kind of a women's perspective and, and add some things on in. That might be really good. And, and I said to Pastor Andrew, I, I don't, I don't think that that's gonna go over. I'm not sure that I even finished asking the question, did I? I think I was like part way into the question and you know, Pastor Andrew suggested that maybe you might wanna, and I, I'm not sure I even got the full question out before you're going, no, 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 no. Don't wanna do that. I want you to notice, she's not up here. You with me? Now, do I think that Lily's got some things to say that would be tremendously valuable for us all to hear this morning. Yes, absolutely, positively. But I also know that that would be fairly radically outside her comfort zone to do this morning for a variety of reasons. And so the fact that she's supposed to to be following my leadership doesn't mean that I'm gonna say, well, I don't care how you feel, I don't care whether you wanna do it or not, you got something to offer, so you know, come right on up here and you, you say what you gotta say. It doesn't work like that. So marriage relationship is not the husband is the guy who's bossing around all the time, that's not the picture. The picture is that in our relationships, love and humility and service should characterize our relationships And there are times when it might come down to somebody's got to make a call on something. Now, there's some areas of our married life where I I know that she's going to make better decisions than I am. So there are points when I'm like, honey, I I really don't know. You know, what do you think? Whatever you think on this one, let's go with that. But I know that there are other times that she's, you know, she's going, Mike, would you just decide something? Don't, please don't, don't leave this pressure on me. I would rather not be responsible for that. You know, would you please just take the lead on this? And actually, probably, I fail to take the lead more often than I impose and say, you know, here's what we're going to do. But there, there are just points when, when maybe one or the other needs to take the lead, and I am delighted in areas where I know that Lily's going to make the better decision, where she's going to do the better job. But she is also just amazingly willing to follow my lead. And sometimes, following my lead means I fall flat on my face. And together we get back up again and we, you know, we go on from there. The most important thing, if I can just put it this way, is that last point. This is saying that the home should not be characterized by chaos and conflict. If nobody ever steps forward to take the lead, there's chaos. And if nobody is willing to say, go ahead, you make the call. There's conflict. God has set up, a, set up the family in this way. It's supposed to reflect in some way Jesus' relationship with the body of Christ that husbands are to love their wives tenderly, sacrificially. And wives are to encourage us in that process. 
older women, you're the ones that are gonna need to help the younger women to see that and to have that in perspective. Because what we're hearing on in our society is that that's an impossible, unreasonable way to live and that that means that somehow women are less. And scripture makes crystal clear that's not the case. Older women, pass on your practical wisdom in this area. Finally, Paul's gonna say this. He's gonna say, all of these things, everything that I'm saying to you, the way that the the older women are to conduct themselves, what they're to do in the lives of the younger women, it is that the word of God may not be reviled. Christians are exhibit A for the gospel. We've got this, this gospel message of a God who transforms lives, and ours are the lives that are out there on display for the world to look at. So, Again, this doesn't mean that women have got to be wives and mothers to glorify God. There are a whole lot of other ways to pursue a relationship with God and to bring God glory. And we'll talk about a couple things in just a moment. But it does mean that if the women of the church do not invest in each other, and if consequently the families of the church are neglected and unhealthy, the credibility of the gospel of Jesus Christ will suffer. No pressure. Let's put it this way. We just need to avoid giving people an excuse to say, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. Paul says, Titus, encourage the older women to live out godly wisdom and to pass on godly wisdom. But I need to point out that this passage is not exhaustive. He tells the older women, teach the younger women this, and this, and this. But teaching and learning aren't limited by what's in this passage. He's mentioning some specific things that in the family of God are particularly important. Um, I wanna say just first of all, women, there are amazing opportunities to equip yourself. Some of the older women are are sitting here and they're going, I don't know what I've got to really pass on. I don't feel equipped. I don't feel ready. There's some amazing resources to avail yourself of. But before you think about how ready you are, I just want you to remember. Do Do you remember what it's like to be single? You remember that it's possible to be a single and even sometimes to be in the hustle and bustle of life and to have a job and maybe be going to school and maybe have all kinds of things that you're doing with your friends and still in the middle of it feel lonely and feel lost and feel directionless and have questions and wonder who could answer them. Do you remember that? Do you remember older moms? Do you remember what it's like to be a newlywed? to be married with no kids and in many ways to be more like the singles than you are like the married with families because the married with families, it's like they're in this other world and you just can't relate to it and somehow you're in the middle and you just really don't quite fit and you're trying to figure out how marriage works and, and, and you don't know where to go and you could ask mom and dad but that just seems too weird and do you remember that? Moms, do you remember what it's like to be a mom of small children? Do you remember how intensely isolated and alone you could feel sometimes because suddenly you're cut off from relationships that you've had and you were tied to home and you don't have the freedom that you had before? Do you remember that? What's it like to be a widow? What's it like to be divorced? What's it like to be a single mom? What's it like to be an empty nester? We've got women at all these different stages. And I want to suggest that the church will thrive best when you connect with one another. If you feel unequipped, well, first of all, you've got the Holy Spirit. And second of all, you've got some life experience. So draw on those things. But draw on on materials that are out there. Right now, there's a... In the bookstore, there's a whole series of things by Carrie Folmar. There's some, some basic Bible studies. I know, Lily, you're a part of a group. Uh, some of the other ladies 
um, in, in a group working on, on this particular Bible study. Great material. Um, there are things that are specific for life stages and decisions that, that apply t- particularly to young women. Um, Lily has appreciated the book Girls Gone Wise. It's one she recommends. Another one to consider would be a book by Jen Wilkin called Women of the Word. This one, this one is basic tools of Bible study, how to study the Bible for yourself, how to handle scripture for yourself competently so that you can take it and learn and feed yourself and pass it on to other people. All kinds of things you can do to get equipped. There are conferences, there are websites, there are, the, the Gospel Coalition has a women's conference, um, Together for the Gospel has got materials. There are all kinds of things you can avail yourself of. And not just that, go ahead and go beyond. There's a point where you're going to want to talk about things that are specific women issues, but why not pick up a book on Doctrine of the Church? Why not pick up a book on something like this that will stretch your mind, desiring God, what it is to live your life in a way that you're taking delight in your God? You could read a theology book. You could do something even a little weightier on studying the Bible for yourself. Equip yourself. And I want to say this. The role of wife and the role of mom in the church, in the light of the gospel, we would say those are high callings. Our culture would demean those things. But I want to also say that it's very possible that among us right now, there could be some women that are going to have a calling to minister more broadly to women of the body of Christ and maybe the body of Christ as a whole. I can remember going through, um, as I was doing my own training, this book by Henrietta Mears, What the Bible is All About. This one has sold uh, over three million copies in print. This is one that's been used over and over and over by by tens of thousands of people, if not more. Henrietta Mears, incredible scholar of the Word of God, and this incredible resource. If you've never read anything by Nancy Piercy, then you've missed out on an opportunity to interact with a world-class intellect. People like Nancy Piercy interacting with ideas and church history and theology. Um, another rising scholar is Margaret Kostenberger. Uh, writing some really amazing stuff. It could be that we've got some younger women or some older women that are right here in our midst that are going to be the ones that are going to be writing some of these books in the future. I don't know what call God has on your life, but whatever it might be, dive in, prepare, tell him yes. All right. I've really taken more time than I probably should have. I want to leave with a few final thoughts. If it's true on our last page that older women in the body of Christ have a strategic role in helping younger women to navigate the challenges of personal and family life in a fallen world, I've got some specific suggestions. And I believe that that is true that older women of the body of Christ have a strategic role in helping younger women navigate the challenges of personal and family life in a fallen world. All right. Last set of suggestions. First, older women, I said it before, but I'll say it again, give the gift of perspective. Look for opportunities to invest in younger women by your wise listening, your wise example, and your wise counsel. You can offer perspective. I beg you, for the sake of Christ, give that gift. Younger women, I wanna wanna challenge you to give the gift of purpose and passion. One of the things that can happen as we're navigating life, you get a little bit older and you start to wonder if you really matter and if you really count and and if you you really bring anything to the table anymore. Do I really have any value? There are older women here who would be delighted to pour themselves into somebody else and have sort of started to wonder what their purpose is. And you bring enthusiasm and you bring passion that makes the oldsters not feel so old anymore. We need you. 
Younger women, give the gift of your purpose and passion. Open the door to older women, and you're going to need to do it because the older women are sitting there, and they're sort of scared of the younger women, and how do I do this, and I know they're busy, and how do I even connect with them, and why would they want to spend time with me? And the younger women are intimidated, and they're saying, well, why would the older woman want to do this? This is going to take some courage from both ends. I want to encourage you to open the door to the older women around you. Let them know you want their input in your life and make yourself available when they are. That's gonna take carving out some time. It's gonna take rearranging some priorities. Sometimes for somebody who's a, who's a mom and a wife to be able to carve out time at six o'clock on Friday is not easy. And so you may need to do some real work to sync up your schedule. You probably have more flexibility in your life than they do, even though it might not look like it. Do everything you can to make it possible. Open that door. And finally, men, I wanna, I wanna challenge you to give the gift of encouragement and support. I want to urge you, husbands, brothers, fathers, I want to urge you to do everything you can to help the women in your lives to put this into practice for the sake of your families and for the sake of the family of God and for the sake of a watching world. God has so designed the gospel that it is connected to the lives of those that respond to it as people evaluate who Jesus is and what God has done through him in calling people to himself, one of the things that they're gonna be looking at is the people who got called. They're looking at us. And how we live our lives, how we walk out that gospel has implications far beyond us and far beyond the people of God. Dear ones, family, sees the best of us. Family sees the worst side of us. But family, when it's healthy, warts and all, when we're looking out for each other, caring for each other, involved in each other's lives, there's nothing more beautiful.